The only biographical information that Russ Warren gave me for his introduction is this. Russ Warren is a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> Pregnant pause. End quote. I began to wonder, what is a pause pregnant with? <laughs> I began to dream, and dreaming led to the conclusion that it depends on who we're talking about. The pause that follows any man or woman's name must be made up of things like those that make up the man or woman. I hope that the pause following my name will be pregnant with someone great. Like George Washington, just with a better face. <laughs> but as is appropriate for an introduction about Russ, I stopped thinking about my hypothetical pregnancy <laughs> and started thinking about his. <laughs> what makes up this man that might fill the metaphorical womb? <laughs> Russ Warren, picture him in your mind's eye. We start, we start with the physical. <laughs> Come now. <laughs> we start with the physicality clearly designed for war in the 10th century. And then discipline all that raw berserker energy into a man bent on theological and philosophical pursuits, and the pause following his name can only be filled with poetry. Here is some of what sounds in the silence after his name, and I quote, The life is a sort of mystic poetry that a sign, a union, a participation of unfolding and enfolding, of two who are one yet two, of three who are one yet three, of this eternal dance might be the highest and deepest truth. Our warrior poet, our warren poet, <laughs> resident unstoppable wordsmith and mind spelunker. <laughs> but let's be honest, only a second Norman invasion could silence our poet Let's not be too hasty, though. <laughs> I doubt even the Normans could quiet this man, and even if they could, the silence that would follow would scare them to death, haunting the entire continent with the words of his poetry, and it would drive them mad. I quote again, We are dead, are gone the way of perdition, Yet life goes through death and holds its keys. Light enfolds in darkness, a virgin womb in which it shines. She is my body, she is my blood. Our salvation is the dawn. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Russ Warren. Thank you. Uh, a few words of personal thanks before I get to what I'm reading tonight, which is actually kind of amazingly bereft of poetry, uh, called What I've Always Wanted to Say. And just like the uh, airing of grievances in Festivus, you have to stay. Uh, but a few, few words of personal thanks. First to Dr. Greg Jones, who has been my companion in Humanities 203. Uh, it's been an honor, sir. Uh, and hearing you read your poem about your daughter uh, reminds me of, of the truth that we're a, a club of select people, uh, but one that goes throughout history and will bind us to many here uh, someday as well. I want to thank Matt Kikasoa as well. I remember the first time we invited him as a group to lecture for 203 and I thought, I will not have a job anymore. <laughs> this man will take my job. Um, it was a wonderful Baroque lecture, and beautiful, and I think about it a lot. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Gidley as well. Uh, I never knew Frankenstein uh, could be so personal and with us if, if 
Those of you who are here did not get a chance to hear his Frankenstein lecture. Track down tapes or audio or a track or something. <laughs> I don't know what we use in AV these days. It's all too fancy for me. Wax Ooh, wax cylinders. <laughs> uh, lastly, to uh, thank Dan Williams for the invitation once again to speak. Uh, just as when I first heard Matt speak, I thought, there goes my job. When I first heard Dan speak at the first GRS, I thought, people used to call me cool. <laughs> never, never again. Never again. It reminded me of a Poe poem uh, that I heard once upon a time. But with that to the side, uh, the one quick note about why this is, the, the way this is set up, and if, if we could start passing out the handout, that would be uh, fabulous. Uh, why this is different, there's actually very little poetry in this, it's mostly theological meditation, uh, but it is punctuated with prayers. Um, what I'd like to do is when I cue us all into that, if you wouldn't mind uh, reading them along with me. Uh, they're broken up by section, you can see that they are there uh, in italics. Uh, so when I mention, for example, Palm Sunday section of prayer, uh, there should be two prayers under that section. If you wouldn't mind reading those uh, with me aloud as we do it, that would be great. So I'll give a minute uh, for that to all start to, to pass its way around. And just a brief introduction to what I will be doing tonight. It's a little belated, but I'd like to walk through Holy Week with you, something that has happened in recent memory uh, and yet is very, very ancient. We're going to take the Via Dolorosa, the way of pain that the Gospels describe for us. So let us prepare to enter the Passion, even if very briefly. The Lord be with you. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord Christ, by the grace of your cross and the power of your resurrection, save me. Save my family. Save my friends. Save my enemies. Save, Lord, all men, as is your desire. Amen. And let us together say the Palm Sunday prayers. The fig tree withers and the temple is cleansed. May the passions within us find the same fate as you, the lover of humankind. Grant us your great mercy on the tree. As you enter into Jerusalem, cleansing the temple, so enter our hearts, O good one, and drive from them the sinful passions that beset us and defile us. For you love humankind, and are the savior of our souls. The point of the Christian life is not to become a better, more moral person. The end, the telos, is to become Christ. Not just to be like him, but to participate in his life and in his body. If we think about this, though, this precludes all moral striving. No matter how hard we work, we will never be filled with the Holy Spirit and so share in the divine nature. Hence the necessity of faith, not just as rational or even moral assent, but coming under the authority and obedience of the King who offers the grace himself so to do. To become Christ is the goal. Who is Christ? He is the Theandros, the God-man, one who in his person as the word indivisibly and unconfusably unites the divine and human natures. How are we in any way to attain to him? We are human persons who through faith and baptism are filled with the Holy Spirit who shares his nature with us. This is why the Spirit rested on Christ in his baptism. This is why our Lord did nothing without the Spirit in his sojourn, so that we as sons of God remade in the pattern of the Son of God might be joined with the Spirit for our salvation. To acquire the Spirit, then, is the goal of the Christian life. To acquire the Spirit is to become Christ. To become Christ is to become divine. 
glorified Theotic. Here is where the central importance of the tabernacle cultus and liturgy, detailed in the middle of the Torah, becomes key. The law was never about becoming moral. It was about becoming a temple, pure, undefiled, holy, a place for God to dwell. The whole point of the commandments of God is not to make him happy, as if our Lord needs that emotion. The one God dwells in blessedness, of which happiness is but a pale shadow. No. The point of the commands is to be prepared for God's residence within us. But just as the unclean always threatened the sanctity of the holy courts, so sin, death, Satan, and the disordered passions threaten Christ's holy temple, his body, the church. This makes the law not about ascent to God to curry favor, but about guarding sacred ground. Ethics, then, is priestly work. This is why St. Siloan, the Athenite's dictum that my brother is my life, is so important. The priests are not doing an individual task, but the collective work of protection and sanctification of the church. I cannot do my work as a priestly guardian without reference to my brothers and sisters, nor without their constant aid and intercession so for strength and forgiveness of sins, which, to digress briefly, is why the communion of saints is so vital. All are saved together. None are saved alone. Let us read the trial. O Lord Christ, as you were silent before your accusers, so we are silent before you, the source of living waters, whom we have spurned time and time again. Open our lips, O Lord, that our mouths might proclaim your praise. Silence the tongues of our accuser, the enemy of all souls, and crush the head of the murdering dragon, granting us your great mercy and the world's salvation. Silence. In the face of his accusers, in the face of of those who held an earthly power over him, he was silent. I've lived for far too long in a world where Jesus is the answer has amounted to far too much BS. We are weak, frail, tired, and anxious. We are still in our sins and readily contribute to the sins of others. When we need others the most, we are most prone to push them away. Everything, especially on the unending public forum of the internet, becomes about ego, about posturing, about the preservation of a self that we hate and that hates us. It so often feels that to become love, to become Christ, is not only impossible, but hopelessly naive, that the narrow gate is smaller than the eye of a needle, that all there is to do is lament and die. And, in fact, this might be exactly right. The truth, if we'd allow ourselves to believe it, is that the cross, the brutalist concession to the great nothingness is written into the very tapestry of the cosmos. We expect beauty and order, symmetry and harmony, so we write off the atonal and the dissonant as at least problematic, if not sinful. But here, if we have eyes to hear and ears to see, we find the crucified one, and with him, to our horror, what causes us truly to recoil are our egos and passions, what we claim as our true selves, which in no shortage of words is defended to our last breath. We care more about being right about ourselves, about the world, about our specialties, than about becoming what it is we are intended to be. This care 
this justification when we should be silent unto death, is what has already led us into the hell in which we find we often exist, or rather, are ceasing to exist. Love continues to be the hardest thing we will ever do. It will always be that way, since we build up the false self, the ego, as a defense against what we perceive as the vast emptiness of existence. Love requires shattering our own self-perception, requires a constant crucifixion, or sharing in the crucifixion, a thing that is never pleasant. We want love to be easy and fulfilling. We want, in other words, constant infatuation. Yet we know how empty and fleeting that is, so we glut and glut and glut and glut in hopes that this time it will last. We add kink, 50 shades of it, to try and reclaim the momentary vision of what we suppose the world is supposed to be. And we fail, and we fail, and we despair. Never knowing that love is there, but it is not what we expected or even wanted. It is dying so that death may not reign anymore. It is crucifixion for the life of the world. And what did we expect? Love is the crucified God. Let us read Good Friday. Adam, our brother, sinned and so toiled among the thistles and the thorns, seeking bread, sweat marking his brow. Upon the brow of Adam's descendant and creator sat a crown of thorns, marking him the bread of life. As Joseph was lifted out of the pit by the remembrance of the cupbearer, so we, Lord, were lifted up on the cross, causing the thief to cry out, Remember me in your kingdom, O Lord. His cry is ours, so that this day we might join you in the paradise who is the Spirit, you who are the lover of humankind and the savior of our souls. I need, it is more than a want or a desire to be able to love. My inclination, a function of nature, is to love and to be loved. How else could it be for a being made in the image of God who acts and reveals himself as love? But in all my sojourn, in all the accumulation of facts, and methodologies of how to understand God, I have not learned love. In fact, I seem now to be more selfish, more self-centered, more in se curvatus than when I started to follow the Christ. This is not to be blamed on him. I doubt that blame could ever be satisfactorily placed. The spirit is ever willing. I have no illusions about what I am asking for. Love is not some emotion or even a, a mere choice. It is a mode of being, an existence leading to hypostatization, leading to being a person. To sentimentalize love, to make it basically romantic, is to miss what love is. To see what it is, what it must be, we must look to the life of Christ, not as a potential way that love happens, but as the hypothesis, the guiding and normative principle of love. The shape of Christ's life is the necessary form of love. What do we see there? Love is inherently self-emptying. Whatever the kenosis means, it involves that original creative impulse by which God made the world. Here is the pouring out of self, the speaking into being of that which will be loved. The same can be seen in the incarnation as well. Because of the fall into sin, though, love necessarily involves suffering. The way of love is the way of pain, as anyone who is loved knows. Even those loves which we would call healthy or stable or fulfilling 
are characterized by deep pain. In Christ, this pain is the way of the cross. All love leads to the cross. All love leads to the death on behalf of the beloved, of the lover. If this is the case with Christ, we should not expect any different with our experience. Let us read together the cross. Your cry, O Christ, upon the tree, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Spoken from God to God, hallelujah. For in our God forsakenness of death, of sin, of corruption, you lie with us, ever crying out in intercession. For you are the love of humankind and the savior of our souls. What about the resurrection, some might ask? The way to resurrection, to love fulfilled and filling, is the way of the cross. There is no other route or road, no other way to resurrection except through the cross. This does mean that in our daily life in Christ, we will suffer daily deaths as we seek to love. These shall lead to resurrections, new opportunities, clarified and purified to love, to love without the passions, without lust or pride or alienation. Until the perfection of love, the transfiguration of Christ's glory that is our ultimate end, these resurrections must lead to further deaths, to more suffering, ever more keenly felt approaching the salvific passion of our Lord in Gethsemane and Golgotha. And so the great question which I've danced around during my entire Christian existence is this. What religion can fulfill this need? Which one can birth and nurture in me love, which is to say, Christ? Keats said, beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. That is all you need to know. What, though, about love? What is beauty without love? What is truth? History provides plenteous examples of these divorced, inquisitions, holocausts, externalism, and so on, each as destructive as the next. Now, some might object, saying that, of course, the Holocaust is more deadly than separating aesthetic beauty from love. And of course, this must be absolutely granted. But let us not forget how many lives have been ruined, male and female, Jew, and Gentile by our so-called beauty industry. Anorexia, bulimia, and obesity being merely the marketable problems. Every human is debased and affected by this perversion. So what is the religion then? I'm concerned here with the salvation of my soul, not in the individualistic sense, nor in the otherworldly. No, salvation is the healing the making whole, the sanctification of the hypostasis. Once the hypostasis, the person is healed, the world finds her hope. This hallowing of the soul is nothing other than training it in love, to bring it back to its nature and unite it with God. What religion can do this? What religion can potentially make saints, not just of prelates and monks, but of the common man or woman? Let us now pray through Holy Saturday. Let all earth keep silent at the sight of your passion, Christ our God. The deathless one dies, and the life of the world hangs lifeless. Lament, weep, and cover your souls with ash, for this is the salvation of the world. The tomb cut out of rock will receive the one proclaimed Behold the man on this day of man's primordial creation. From dust to dust you return to be resurrected the third day, so that we, being dust, might be raised with you to heaven. For you are the lover of humankind and the savior of our souls. Lord, as you work in your repose, Forgive us as we have in your absence followed the crucifier, enjoyed wielding the sword, and bowed before the calf of gold. Make us see in your rising 
that you reign from the tree, bearing forth the cross, and falling down only before the Father, who with you and the Holy Spirit has proclaimed the healing of the world. I was looking at my eldest daughter the other day and was reminded that her existence is one of love. She exists because of love. The analogy of man and wife being that of Christ and the church. Even more, she is given the ability to become what she is in potentiam by being loved. Our children become persons, actualized hypostases, by and through the act and agency of parental love. We live out, that is, the Velveteen Rabbit. Seriously. What a responsibility. What a burden. What hope do our children have as we do not love as we should? The present grace of God, who is love, is our and their hope. This is, of course, no excuse for us to not suffer the death of love for our children, as God always works with his creatures to accomplish his good purposes. Here is our source, then, for the common good of our salvation, marriage, and the love of our children. Even if you never marry or bear, you were born, and so stand in this communion. You bear spiritual children with more fecundity than Leah. Let's not forget that the most fertile woman in history was not Eve, but Mary, who gave birth to our salvation. What religion provides the necessary ascesis to love these, these children, and by the extension of the grace of God, other children who are not necessarily biologically related. For in the loving of my children, not only do they become persons, but I as well. Our brother, our sister, our children, our students, our teachers. Your servant Solomon, O Lord, tells us death is never full. But look, O God, at how he strains and twists, being filled with the fullness of him who fills all in all. Death is the privation of all things, a cavernous emptiness. Yet he groans in pain as your infinity takes Sabbath in the tomb. The one who is love created all things out of nothing. Now he descends to the nothing in love to recreate his beloved world. He, he is called, O oh, you dead in body. Attend to his word, you who yet live. I am the resurrection and the life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tomb, bestowing life. Amen, and thank you. about time to go eat a lot of ice cream. <laughs> the challenge for you is uh, put on by my grandfather when he was a child. He ate so much ice cream he froze the lining of his stomach. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> we'll be back in about nine minutes. <laughs>